So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Joyce Martin, and on behalf of the Labriola National American Indian Data Center, I'd like to welcome you and to say how happy I am to have Professor Sarah Deer um, here today. She's a professor of law at William Mitchell College, and she's here to speak with us today about her award-winning book, The Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America. Before we begin the program, I'd like to thank a few people without whom this event would not be possible. First, I'd like to thank Dr. David Martinez, the chair of the judging committee and the members of the judging committee, Dr. Myla Vicente Carpio, and Professor Simon Ortiz. And I'd also like to extend a special thank you for Dr. Karen Leong from ASU's Women and Gender Studies, Asian Pacific American Studies in the School of Social Transformation for her support of and publicity for this event. I would also like to thank the student employees of the Labriola Center who helped, as always, with all the preparations of this event and also for Margaret Schmidt um, for her help in setting up the event and for their refreshments as well. And I'd also like to thank ASU Libraries Business Operations Manager Lily Johnson for all of her hard work on this event and the Associate University Librarian Phil Konomis for his continued support of all of our programs here in Labriola Center, as well as ASU's University Librarian, Dr. Jim O'Donnell. So if you haven't had the opportunity, there are some refreshments in the classroom. So um, please, following the interview, please help yourself to some refreshments. Um, at this point, I would like to turn the program over to Dr. Martinez and Professor Deer. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Thank you, Joyce. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, we appreciate you being here on this first day of finals week. We know it's a busy time. However, we're quite excited about this year's event. And so I'd like to begin by uh, briefly introducing myself. I am David Martinez, I'm the chair of the work committee. I'm also an associate professor in American Indian Studies. And so I had the honor of uh, being a part of the selection process that awarded Dr. Deere um, her distinction. And so I'd like to mention the format for today's event. Basically, I'm going to interview, after introducing Dr. Our Professor Deere, mm -hmm. I'm going to interview her for about half an hour or so at which point I'll turn the floor over to the audience for Q&A. So since this event is being recorded, I, I ask that you please refrain from asking any questions in, until that point. And so to begin with, I want to make introductions. Um, a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, Sarah Deer, as an activist and professor of law at Walt William Mitchell, has documented in her scholarship the historical and ideological underpinnings of the failure to adequately protect victims of physical and sexual abuse in Indian country. Furthermore, Professor Deer has worked with grassroots and national organizations at navigating the complex legal and bureaucratic hurdles confronting Native survivors of, of violence. Indeed, Professor Deere's work has allowed her to mediate between sectors within Native communities who disagree on the appropriate role of the U.S. legal system on reservations and on how to most effectively respond to the issue of violence against women. As a result of her efforts, Professor Deere spearheaded the 2007 Amnesty International Report, Maze of Injustice, in which she reframed the problem of sexual violence in any country as an international human rights issue. Moreover, she brought Native American leaders, health specialists, and women's advocates together around the intersection between violence against women and tribal governance, thereby launching widespread efforts to reform federal policies that interfere with the ability of tribes to prosecute offenders. Professor Deere's diligence as an advocate thus was instrumental in the passage of two landmark pieces of legislation. First, the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010, which increases the sentencing power of tribal courts and requires federal district attorneys to provide detailed information to tribal authorities about cases under their jurisdiction that will not be prosecuted. Secondly, the 2013 Reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which restored some of the authority that was stripped from tribal governments by Oliphant v. Suquamish in 1978. 
thereby giving tribal courts the power to prosecute non-Indians who assault native spouses or dating partners or violate a protection order on tribal lands. And of course, um, in 2014, Professor Deere was named a MacArthur Fellow. And most recently, and importantly, <laughs> she's the 2016 winner of the Labriola American Indian Book Award. So Sarah, welcome and congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. I'd like to begin by asking you some questions about the origin of your book. Okay. Specifically, I'd like you to, to, to tell us uh, where you're from, um, how you got involved in the legal profession, and what work were you doing on behalf of Native women that led to the writing of The Beginning and End of Rape? Great, great. Well, I was uh, raised in Wichita, Kansas, um, and both my undergraduate and my law degree are from the University of Kansas. I started as a rape crisis advocate, a volunteer rape crisis advocate with a nonprofit in Lawrence when I was just 20 years old. Mm -hmm. I went through a 40-hour training program and then um, as an advocate then participated in uh, supporting survivors who reported the crime in, in Lawrence proper. Um, but I also answered crisis line calls from um, basically anyone within the community who maybe um, had been assaulted a long time ago, hadn't reported the crime. Um, and so that's when I became you know, familiar with the dynamics that students at Haskell were um, experiencing. So people who had been assaulted maybe uh, on a reservation as a child, mm -hmm. but there was no program mm -hmm. to, to anyone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And so when they got to college <coughs> at Haskell, then they had an opportunity to call a hotline for the first time. And that's where I really began to understand the depth of despair that Native right. women were experiencing. Right, right, right. And so I wonder if you could explain for us the, the topic of your book. Mm -hmm. um, in your introductory chapter, you talk about the distinction between rape and domestic violence, mm -hmm. which to an inattentive reader might sound like you're, you're splitting hairs, Sure. But, but of course you're not. So with that in mind, I'd like you to clarify these two terms. Mm -hmm. In addition to which, can you tell us about the relationship between uh, the so-called epidemic mm -hmm. of rape mm -hmm. in Native communities and colonialism? Sure. Um, well, the difference between domestic violence and sexual assault is important from a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. um, survivors of, of these crimes may have very similar needs and mm -hmm. deserve similar forms of justice, mm -hmm. but the legal system treats them very separately and mm -hmm. treats them differently. And what I mean by that is um, that domestic violence necessitates a relationship an intimate partner relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. Mm -hmm. So typically we call that you know, a, a either a spousal or as you mentioned, dating partners um, who commit all kinds of acts of violence against their partner or former partner. Sexual violence, the reason I parse that out separately is because that can be committed by a wide variety of people not in a relationship with the victim. Mm -hmm. So neighbors, cousins, friends, uncles, um, you know, those kinds of things wouldn't fall under the auspices of domestic violence, mm -hmm. um, but deserve focus as a form of violence that's distinct from that. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and, the, and especially after the 2013 reauthorization, um, there's a big difference in the way the law looks at those two categories of right. crime. Right, right. And you take issue with describing uh, this problem Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you take issue with calling it an epidemic. Yeah. Or why, why is that? Well, I, I've been using that term myself, the term right. epidemic. And I think um, I started to hear the mantra repeated so often that I thought, well, I, maybe I want to interrogate that a little bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of everybody from the President of the United States to activists at the local level were saying when one in three Native women is experiencing rape, uh, it's an epidemic. Or uh, they would, sometimes you'll hear people <coughs> say, uh, a problem of epidemic proportions. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started to think about that word a little bit when I got ready to put the manuscript together. And um, I thought, what is that the right word? Um, epidemic, although it's used in social problems to d describe social problems, really is a biological term mm -hmm. that something is spreading, you know, a uh, pandemic or an epidemic is a virus that might be spreading. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if, we, if we're using that word, are we, 
in some way depoliticizing the problem, mm -hmm. right? So I started to think about whether epidemic was the appropriate term when we're talking about a colonial problem that does assign blame, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I suggest in my book that that might not be the most appropriate term right, that we right. could use. Right, right, right. So with uh, these terms in mind, you know, these definitions, um, what picture do we have mm -hmm. of the problem of domestic violence or sexual violence mm -hmm. in Native communities? You spend a lot of time looking at the data that's been collected. And so can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, the data, it's really interesting because the first um, when I first graduated from law school was the first time the federal government had released any sort of report about the data relating to crime mm -hmm. committed by and against Native people. Mm -hmm. So I it timed it very interestingly that when I first started um, working for the Department of Justice uh, as, a, as a brand new attorney mm -hmm. um, that this report <coughs> came out. Mm -hmm. And the report indicated that Native people experience violent crime at a rate two and a half to three times higher than the, the rest of the population. Um, now, most Native people I spoke to weren't particularly surprised mm -hmm. by that um, statistic. It was just, how, why did it take the government so long to be able to mm -hmm. talk about it? Mm -hmm. um, and since then, we have a lot of sort of frequency rates that have come out of the fe federal government, basically victimization surveys. They take a random sample of Americans and ask them, you know, who, who are you? What is your identity? What is your race? Have you ever experienced X, Y, Z, right? And then that's where this data comes from. Mm -hmm. And since 1999, I've been really scrutinizing all this data to try to, you know, articulate um, what exactly is the scope of the problem. And I have yet to run into a study that suggests, that looks at Native people, right? Because a lot of the studies don't even look at us, mm -hmm. right? But, but I've never seen a study yet um, where Native people aren't listed as experiencing the highest rates mm -hmm. of crime. Mm -hmm. Now, what troubles me about it is I've spent a lot of energy, you know, as a scholar and an activist, try to, trying to look through this data and decide what it means. But I feel like we're sort of stuck in a way. Like, mm -hmm. we have this Western scientific data that tells right. us the frequency. Right. But there's a lot of things we still don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think to really suss out what is needed at this particular local and regional levels. Mm -hmm. There needs to be more research that's created, funded, and, mm -hmm. and uh, implemented by mm -hmm. Native women. Mm -hmm. um, so there's very, there's very little that we do know, but what mm -hmm. we do know is very distressing. Mm -hmm. So what do we know about uh, this dreadful phenomenon in Native communities that is maybe unique to our communities that isn't found in um, mm -hmm. non-Indian communities? Well, I, you know, in terms of why the f rates are as high as they are, mm -hmm. I've, s I've struggled with that um, myself because I feel somewhat handicapped by my training in law. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot of factors that you would need to look at um, mm -hmm. in order to sort of articulate why, right? right? There's, um, there's a generational trauma. Um, there mm -hmm. uh, is poverty. There's right, unemployment. Right. All the you know all these right. different social factors. Right, right. But what I've really focused on, because I think it's where I where I where I shine a little bit, is in legal analysis. Mm -hmm. Is I think the legal system has failed Native mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. and Native people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went out when I when I went about writing this book. That's right. the story I wanted to tell. Is right. you know not to say that it's legal issues at the exclusion of others, but rather what are the legal issues that create this vulnerability. Right, right. And so with regards to um, a Native perspective mm -hmm. on addressing this problem, um, at two different points in your, your book, you raise the, uh, uh, the resource of um, traditional culture, mm -hmm. for, for lack of a better phrase. And you do, do so in, in two different ways. At one end of the spectrum, you talk about uh, native responses mm -hmm. to sexual violence. And then at uh, the other end of the spectrum, if you will, with regards to the, um, the recent trend in restorative justice, mm -hmm. you, you, you talk about traditional culture and its limits in a, in a different way. Let, let, let's begin at the, the, the other end of the spectrum. 
the historical research that you did mm -hmm. in Native responses to sexual violence. Can you, can you summarize that for us? Sure. Well, I think I think using my tribe as an example is probably the the best way that I can articulate it. And mm -hmm. and. Um, when I started to research Muscogee responses to violence back when I was a law student, uh, I, w I was troubled that I wasn't finding a lot of information about how Muscogee people would have responded to gendered yeah. violence. Yeah. Um, and when my uh, professor, who's Robert Porter, a Seneca uh, yeah. man who encouraged me to pursue this line of inquiry, um, he uh, suggested I look at maybe what some non-Indians had to yeah. say about it. You know, with yeah. understanding there can be a lot of things wrong with what, what the observers would have th thought. But um, William Bartram commented in his journals, who was a, an American botanist, um, that he had lived among Creek and Cherokee people for mm -hmm. 10 years and had never seen an Indian man beat an Indian woman or even speak disrespectfully to them. So that started to um, emerge for me anyway, this idea that there was an entire system, a culture, which didn't allow these kinds of crimes to occur. That there was something, it wasn't a response, it was deterrence, mm -hmm. right? There was something within, inherent within our Muscogee culture that, that would not have allowed a crime like that to happen. Mm -hmm. And then I found our first rape law, the first Creek rape law, mm -hmm. um, in my, further in my studies, uh, which is, is fascinating in the sense that it's written in 1824, um, and it talks about the woman who's the victim actually having the opportunity to articulate the response to that crime. Mm. And that's certainly not what the Anglo-American system was doing with that crime in right. 1824. Right, right. So I, I was really intrigued by the idea that we had cultures which innately protected Native women from these experiencing these kinds of crimes. Native men didn't commit these kinds of crimes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, not that they never did, but that it was mm -hmm. extremely rare. Mm -hmm. um, so that really got me interested in thinking about, well, can we revitalize some of those values? Right. What, what, what were those values that allowed us to live in a way where we weren't always afraid? Mm -hmm. Because that's, I think, what Native women experience today is fear. Right, right, right. And with regards to the impact on Native communities uh, from sexual violence. You even, even tell anecdotes about women teaching their daughters about what to do when they're attacked. Not if they're Not attacked, if. but when they're attacked. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to Native women, asked them you know, about what they experienced as a sexual assault victim, and the, the question is usually, well, which time? Mm -hmm. Which one mm -hmm. do you want me to talk about? Mm -hmm. It's it's that pervasive. Mm -hmm. So as you were you were, you were researching your book, um, what resources did Native women have available to them after being assaulted? Um, today, or well, traditionally? Well, or both. <laughs> let's do both. Let's do traditionally first. Yeah. Well, I think we had uh, systems um, in place, and again, whenever you write about Native people, of course, there's always going to be this generalization, right, mm -hmm. where you're sort of taking all these cultures and plopping them into a, um, one sort of monolithic group, which is inaccurate. But I think by, by far what I have started to sense in, in the 15 years I've been studying this issue is that our, um, our, our cultural and spiritual ways, which were difficult to necessarily pull apart, um, would, would respond to these crimes in a way that dignified the victim. Right. And so often in the Anglo-American world, uh, the victim is stigmatized and the victim is blamed and the victim is mistreated by the legal system, whereas the tribal systems, the values anyway, that you've been able to, that I've been able to tease out, were about really the dignity mm -hmm. of that victim. So take the system we have today and, and turn it on its head, really. Okay. And since the reservation era, yes. uh, when the, um, uh, the Major Crimes Act uh, uh, was passed, uh, things change for, for Indian nations mm -hmm. considerably. C can you talk about the, the repercussions from that era? Sure, so what I've been really interested in, both as sort of the legal history, but also the legal future, I think, is the effort to um, to supplant tribal justice systems by the federal government. So mm -hmm. starting um, really in the late 19th century, the message that was coming out of Congress and out of the federal government was uh, Native people can't be trusted um, to police themselves. Mm -hmm. That in order to actually 
um, do crime control in Indian country, you have to have the federal government or the state government involved in your day-to-day -day business. Mm -hmm. um, and the message then that was sent, I think, to tribal leaders and to Native women is, you know, your system is not good enough. Mm -hmm. Your system needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. And, and as a result, the whatever systems that we had that cultivated a sense of safety and dignity for women mm -hmm. were replaced with a system that doesn't even treat white women very well. Mm -hmm. um, and so by taking that system and supplanting tribal justice systems, we have what we have today, which is a system that's just broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so with regards uh, to sexual violence itself, you and, and other scholars have talked about this as well, that sexual violence, that rape, is an extension of colonialism. And so, at the risk of, of asking a redundant question, can you elaborate on, on that connection for us? Well, when, when I think about um, colonial violence, you know, I think about entitlement, mm -hmm. and I think about humiliation, mm -hmm. and I think about um, uh, isolation, right? Yeah. So I think about all of these different terms that can be applied to um, a people whose whose lives are being completely upended and mm -hmm. either forced removal or you know mass murder or what have you. That there's all of these tactics mm -hmm. that a colonial power will use, mm -hmm. and those are oftentimes the very same tactics that a rapist will use. Mm -hmm. So the humiliation, the shame, isolation, right. silence, right. all of those things right. that have happened to Native nations right. on a sort of a macro level ex are experienced by rape victims on a sort of micro level. Right. Um, right. So that's how I see the connection. Right, right. And so you, you, you speak eloquently about how when a woman is the target of sexual violence that it's not just a crime or violation against an individual but her entire community. Mm -hmm. can, can you elaborate on that observation? Well, I think uh, this this is something that, that started to present to me when, again, working with students at Haskell who had been victims of sexual assault, mm -hmm. um, is that this wasn't an isolated event. This mm -hmm. was an event that happened, they knew, maybe not directly, but they had a sense that their mother, their grandmother, their great-grandmothers, their aunts, mm -hmm. Uh, their cousins had, had all experienced this kind of crime. And so um, when you're sort of thinking about in, a, in the aftermath of a very traumatic event, you're trying to figure out what that means for you and what your life is going to be like moving forward, you're automatically then thinking about your whole community. And now I'm part of this. I knew mm -hmm. something happened to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. She never talked about it, but right. I knew something happened to her. Right. And now I'm living this legacy. Right. And I can't separate my, I can't isolate my experience from the experience of my ancestors who right. have been experiencing this right, crime. Right, right, right. So with regards to re redressing this crisis, you analyze um, um, the Native community's options in three levels. At one level, the system as it exists since the Major Crimes Act was, was passed you analyze it in terms of tribal nations appropriating the Western legal system into their communities, and you talk about it in, in terms of what the traditional options mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. i.e. restorative justice. Mm -hmm. can, can you go over those three options for us? So, um, so thinking about tribes that have sort of taken on the trappings of the Western legal system, in some ways is a source of survival, right? That if, we, if, we, if we're gonna set up a justice system, it has to be legitimate. It has to look legitimate from the outside. And so we're gonna basically adopt criminal codes that are you know, either written for us by the BIA or largely copy and pasted from state law. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna run our criminal justice system just like the state system with a you know, definite focus on, on uh, punishment all right, and those are the kinds of things we're going to do. And um, as I said before, you know, our system, I think the American legal system has a, has a long way to go before we do to truly have a system that's safe for victims of sexual assault, right? Um, the problem then is, you know, what is our alternative? If, if that system is not something that either is working or is something that seems um, comfortable in our community, then what? Um, and so I see a lot of um, 
proposals to think about using sort of a peacemaking, peacemaking not just as a Navajo concept, but sort of as a general sort of concept of restorative justice that purports to be traditional, right? Is that the answer? And I've been troubled by some of the literature on, on restorative justice, and so I think that may be the chapter that gets me in the most trouble. <laughs> but, um, uh, but some of the literature, I think, minimizes and sanitizes violence and sort of says, well, if we've got a, a conflict in the community, you know, the best way to, to deal with that is to go to a peacemaker or go to a mediator and sort of talk it out. Um, and that, to, as, a, as a former victim advocate, deeply concerns me. I don't mean to say that it would never work, but just that we shouldn't assume that we don't like the Western system, so we're going to bring this system and revitalize it, and that's going to be the solution. So I think we have to think about hybrid systems now, systems that hold people accountable, maybe through retribution and punishment, but that are also very holistic and healing for the victim. And I don't know if that system exists yet, um, but that's that's sort of the conclusion I've drawn as to what we might need. Right, right. Now, let me... Um flip the issue and talk about um, Native men. Insofar as all our communities have been um, uh, the victims of colonialism, historical trauma, mm -hmm. um, intergenerational trauma, in instances when the assailant is a Native male, um, and, and I don't mean this question to be crass, but is there such a thing as a colonial, colonialism defense? That's a very interesting question. I've actually looked at that issue and I, I teach in, in uh, Minnesota. And in Minnesota, there was an attempt to introduce a cultural defense, I think in the context of the Hmong community. I think it was a domestic violence case. And the court, um, the, the Minnesota courts were like, no, we're not gonna go there, you know. Um, Colonial defense. I mean, I think you see, I don't think it's unique to Native people. I think many times you do see in the mainstream American legal, legal system somebody saying, well, I was molested as a child or I was mistreated as a child and that's why I do this. And so I guess you could see, you, I could see somebody raising that as a defense in, in a tribal setting as well. Uh, I'm sure it's happened, but um, you know, my response to that, again, coming sort of from the hard edge victim advocate world is there are a lot of people who've survived colonialism, and they don't all sexually assault people. Exactly. And so that's, that's my, my legal response to that. <laughs> and an excellent one it is. Thank you. Um, what about the, the prospect for future reform? What would you like to see mm -hmm. done in the years ahead? Well, you know, most of the, the reform work I've been involved with, say, in the last six or seven years, has really been about federal law reform. And I think we've made some great strides, and I think we've spent our energy judiciously in terms of thinking about that kind of reform. But what really needs to happen, I think, to really make a, a, a dent in this crisis is for tribal nations to sort of pick up the mantra themselves. We go to Washington a lot. I've been um, working on Supreme Court briefs as well, because there's, there's work happening in Congress, there's work happening in the courts. But the tribal nations um, are where the true change is going to happen. And that's where I'd like to see more reform happen. Tribal laws sometimes are very antiquated. I see, still see, for instance, and it's not the fault of the tribe necessarily, but I still see, for example, a spousal exemption on sexual assault in tribal codes. Now that's not a tribal value, but somehow it's, you know, made its way into our codes and hasn't left. So to really focus inward as tribal nations and think about what can we do on our own, on our own terms, in our own ways, that's going to begin to provide some justice. With, with, with that in mind, be, before I, I, I turn things over to the audience, I want to ask you to tell us about your grandfather Okay. <laughs> about the bumper sticker that he kept on his vehicle and what those words meant to you. Um, so I talk about this in, in one of the chapters about federal law reform and I, I wrote it, you know, feeling somewhat conflicted about being a staunch tribal sovereignty ad 
advocate, but also going to Washington DC all the time, <laughs> you know, and, and how you can reconcile that. And so I tell the story about, um, about my grandfather who was, um, after he retired and, and he was, you know, um, living in, in southeastern rural Kansas, that he had that bumper sticker you can get at a lot of different powwows and stuff that says, trust the government, ask an Indian, <laughs> right? Uh, and he, he had that bumper sticker. In fact, I think he had it actually not on the bumper, but actually higher up so more people could see it. Um, and, and, and I think he got a big kick out of thinking about, you know, what people thought in rural Kansas about that. Um, but at the same time, you know, while he was being, I think, um, snarky at some level, um, he, he was not an anti-federal government Indian. I mean, he had a very strong feelings about the history of the federal government Indian tribes, but he served in the Kansas legislature. Um, and he was a school superintendent, and he, you know, he was engaged. He was in the National, uh, I'm sorry, in the Army Reserves. And so I figured if Grandpa figured out a way to be both anti-federal government Indian and yet, you know, engaged in um, non-tribal governance, you know, in terms of military service and legislatures, um, that maybe I could figure out a way to reconcile it for myself. <laughs> so, so that's the bumper sticker story. Well, he, he obviously was a great inspiration yes. to you. And Al, I like that story very much. Thank you. With that, I'd like to turn things over to the audience. So any questions that you have for our guests, just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Madison? Um, one of one of the um, I follow your work a lot, and one of the articles that uh, meant a lot to me was um, the one you wrote on decolonizing rape law. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember talking to you about it at one point in time. And what what um, really struck me with that article was when you started talking, you critiquing the peacemaking systems, and um, and then later on down you had introduced the idea of a uh, tribal rape uh, courts, mm -hmm. um, sort of modeled after the South African or uh, South Africa rape courts. Mm -hmm. And that idea really stuck with me throughout my thesis writing. And mm -hmm. so in my thesis, I was kind of thinking about um, tribal rape courts. Um, I, I feel like they would be good because you also talk about community-based justice models. Right. Um, and so that sort of got me thinking um, a lot. And, um, and kind of taking from Rebecca Sosi as well on her um, topic of cultural sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of wondering, kind of listening to you talk about um, how we pull from the Western systems because we think those are legitimate. Right. And um, so in this whole idea of how do we start recreating our own justice systems, um, for me, I have kind of like, it's, it's, um, it'd be good to see these hybrid justice systems. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I wanted to see more of like guess this, this um, renewing of sovereignty because how sovereignty is now how we understand it it's more from that political sovereignty this you know federal um, federal to tribal relationship and for me that's where I kind of see the problem because of all these precedent case laws you know how they structure sovereignty and they put all these limitations on tribal jurisdiction so I was wondering um, if you thought that if we sort of reposition um, sovereignty from a cultural um, framework and worldview, and we use that framework and or this re like renewed definition of sovereignty, whatever that looks like, and it's right. probably going to look different for right. each tribe. Um, if you could sort of see if we use that perspective of sovereignty to make our own laws, mm -hmm. um, so that way they're legitimate to us, yes. and we can create then create our own hybrid systems where we can like you said, prosecute, but also focus on healing or uh, victim-centered uh, approaches for these kind of crimes that happen in our community. So I was just wondering if you would, because that's what I'm sort of thinking about for like, you know, future reform. Sure. Because um, um, sort of, yeah, that, that, but I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Well, I get this question a lot. I've written a book that raises, I think, a lot of questions, but sometimes people want more in terms of answers. Um, and I, I haven't, I, I have to say that there's probably, you know, there's, there's probably tribal legal systems and structures out there that are doing a really, really good job with this kind of crime. 
Um, and most of the time when they're working well, it's really nobody else's business. You know what I mean? I mean, it's something that's happening in the community that's meaningful to the community, but there's not necessarily an obligation to sort of advertise it. So I don't want to say that it doesn't exist, but I do think that um, thinking about sovereignty and putting the safety of people at the center of that, what sovereignty means. And I think, I, I quote Matt Fletcher, I think somewhere in my book saying, sovereignty is not just sovereignty for sovereignty's sake. That it, that it has to be about furthering the cause of, you know, our ce celebrating our existence, right? That, that that's, that's what it's about. And um, so I think that it's very difficult to be self-governing and to be self-sufficient if more than a third of the women and children in the community are suffering from trauma. And so I think reclaiming sovereignty, maybe reshaping it and massaging it, thinking about it not just in the sense of a Western, like here's our borders and we are, uh, you know, we are a nation, but to govern ourselves effectively means that we don't hurt each other and that women in our community who are hurt receive some kind of justice and some semblance of safety. So what that looks like is the hard part. And I do think that, you know, maybe specialized courts are an option. Um, we have, you know, the, the Western system understands this, is starting to understand this, where you have drug courts, where people who struggle with drug and alcohol abuse um, go into a system that's not punitive, but designed to heal, right? And, and so there is a, a, a precedent for specialized court systems. And I, the only place I've heard of our specialized court system for sexual violence is in South Africa. Um, I don't know how effective it is. I don't know if it's answering the problem that, that they've had there, which is, uh, I think South Africa can rival Indian country in terms of rape frequency. So I'm not sure what that would look like, but the idea behind it is to revitalize the values, right? So my tribe used to whip people who raped. I'm not a big fan of corporal punishment in the contemporary setting. I mean, maybe there's places where it could work, but the value behind that, to say that if you hurt somebody, right, you will be held accountable, that's what I think we can revitalize. So I don't have the pick perfect model in my head of what it needs to look like, but those are the kinds of discussions that I think have to happen at the, at the local level. Thanks for the question. Indeed. Other questions? Yes. Um, so I really appreciated your book. And one of the things um, that stayed with me was the story of Dana. And I think that sharing a personal story is really important for people who are non-native especially to really understand this is what happens. And so I have two questions. I have one question is if there's any update on her case, because I think I think the last that it was left here was that it was in a, uh, a pardoning process. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, um, as we know that the victims are of all genders, right? right? Male, women, and then in a lot of tribal communities, third genders or four genders. Right. And so I was curious why you chose to focus on women mm -hmm. versus, say, including men or um, like two-spirited genders or third mm -hmm. or four genders. Thank you for the question. Um, Dana is still in prison. Um, her petition for clemency to President Obama is still pending. Um, however, she has received her release date. Um, so she's going to be leaving prison in September. And I just uh, emailed her recently, just last week, we were going back and forth. She's going to relocate to Denver, where her mother lived. Um, and she has a plan um, to transition and re-entry. Uh, I think that will probably happen before we get any kind of notice on the, on the clemency petition. I mean, the clemency office right now is so focused on um, nonviolent drug offenders. That's sort of the Obama legacy um, for clemency is to release nonviolent drug offenders. And so I think uh, a case like Dana's is um, is is pretty difficult. Um, you know, ma imagine the headlines. You know, what, what would happen if Obama had released a baby killer? Right? Is what, how it would be framed. Unfortunately, um, but Dana's doing well. She has planned. Uh, she has plans. She is going to be um, with her daughters, her three daughters that she's been separated from, and um, I think very scared and very nervous, but ready to um, to start the next chapter of her life. And what an inspiration that she is.
Um, as far as your second question goes, I think it's really well, um, it's, uh, your, your point is well taken in that I, I do focus on women. And I think the reason probably that the book does focus on women at, to the exclusion of other groups of victims in Indian country is because it was, um, the book is really a creation that came out of the, the, wor the work that I've been writing for about 15 years. So a lot of the chapters started out as articles. And that's really what I've been working on, is gendered violence and how women experience it. But I think that the conversation that I've seen happening at the national level is broadening. Um, and there is more work being done. Um, I've seen just in the last couple of weeks several um, Native women's programs in Indian country to deal with violence are uh, taking on a two-spirit or third or fourth gender um, training programs for all of their advocates. And so I think, I think things are broadening. I think the reason I focused on women is simply because it was, you know, all I was dealing with at the time. And I worked in the Violence Against Women office in Washington, D.C. for the first three years out of law school uh, as a grant program manager. And so I, I got into that violence against women sort of box, right? Um, but it needs, to be, it needs to be blown up a little bit. So I, I appreciate your question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I noticed that one of the blurbs for your book comes from uh, Ramila Cody. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking about her work and as an activist and as a singer, and then the popularity of Louise Erdrich's novel, The Roundhouse. Exactly. The National Book Award. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak to uh, not just the humanities, but the potential for the arts to sort mm -hmm. of reach audiences, uh, native and non-native, mm -hmm. to bring them the same kind of message. Uh, absolutely. Um, so Red Melicote is a recording artist, um, Miss, a former Miss Navajo, and somebody that um, really helped me understand more about Dana's case, which is one of the chapters about Dana Deegan and who's in prison. Um, and so um, she's had a great influence on me in thinking about um, what violence can do, how she ended up in prison because of abusive, an abusive relationship. And so her, her music and her songs and her message, I think, is, uh, is, is, is an incredible avenue for educating uh, people who may not you know, be reading a legal book, right? Um, and then in, the, in terms of the arts, I mean, I've seen so many amazing awareness projects that have come with creativity that's, that's been sort of spilling out. Um, uh, the, the organization that I'm closest to is the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition, and they have the Barrette Project. So um, victims of sexual violence, native victims of sexual violence, donate a beaded barrette or some other form of traditional hairpiece. Um, they're put on, on red velvet boards with stories. Um, and some of them are anonymous and some of them are not. And you know, taking that around to different locations and, and encouraging people to participate and to, to read the stories um, is, is, I think, you know, and there's many other projects. There's an earring project and a, um, a moccasin project. And there's, there's more of these happening. And I think they're incredibly important um, because they allow people to participate and on their own terms and their own ways. And so I really see um, fiction, um, artwork, dance, song, all of these being integral to the social justice movement I'm interested in. Way in the back. Yeah, I came in a little late. I, I don't know if you addressed this point or not, but I'm curious, uh, how uh, far along is the implementation of VAWA? And uh, then is there a broader movement to overturn all of Yes, and yes. <laughs> um, so the implementation of VAWA um, has, uh, in terms of the Oliphant mini fix, or the quasi fix, or whatever I'm calling it today, um, uh, there have been several tribes now that have prosecuted non-Indians. Um, Pasquayaki was the first. Uh, in fact, their first jury trial of a non-Indian ended in acquittal, uh, which was fascinating because you know one of the big pushbacks from, from uh, uh, partisan politics was that, you know, non-Indians can't get a fair trial in tribal court, and so the first case was an acquittal. Um, uh, Tulalip closely followed um, that, and um, as one of the judges that Tulalip mentioned in a, in a conference I was attending, the sky did not fall, right? It was just like prosecuting an Indian. It was not very interesting, um, and, and really wanted to put that message out there because it was like, oh no, you know, what's gonna happen when tribal courts start prosecuting non-Indians? 
The sky did not fall. Um, and there's more and more tribes that are, are, are putting themselves in the position to implement and prosecute non-Indians. Um, uh, I think there's a big training going on, in fact, next week at Sisseton uh, about implementation. In terms of your second question uh, about a full Oliphant fix, um, so there's sort of um, National Congress of American Indians is um, working with a new bill introduced by Franken and Tester, which would broaden the fix to include um, uh, child abuse and drug trafficking, non-Indians. Um, I've been working with uh, I, I, I've been working with some other folks who say let's not do this piecemeal anymore. Let's go for a full fix. Um, some people think politically that's just not palatable and that Congress is going to just give us slivers at a time. And I'm personally torn on the strategy, whether going for the full fix is just going to mean it won't happen um, and whether these slivers of fixes um, are actually potentially going to be turned against us and treated as a delegation of federal power rather than a restoration of inherent power. Um, so I'm thinking down the road to the federal courts looking at this issue. But yes, the conversation is continuing. And one of the reasons it is is because tribal prosecutors are saying, I can't charge this guy with child endangerment, but I can charge him with domestic assault. So I'm only able to charge a portion of what happened that night and how frustrating that is. And so those are the stories I think tribal prosecutors are probably going to be testifying in front of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs any day now to explain how frustrating that is to only be able to charge a sliver of what the actual event was all about. Uh, one more question before we let Professor Deer off the hot seat. If not, the, oh. One more. One about more. The activism surrounding the missing and So um, I've been following the, the <coughs> social justice work being done around missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada. Um, and I believe, just based on my experience talking to, to women about this issue, is that we have a parallel problem in the United States that has not been articulated in the way that it has in Canada. Um, and when I started to do some research on this um, about maybe about nine years ago, it uh, became too overwhelming. So I was sort of trying to track down stories of missing Native women in the news and also unidentified remains of Native women in the news and wondering if we have the same story here. And I believe that we do, especially when you think about parallel histories and parallel rates of domestic violence and right, those kinds of things, we have a very similar experience in the United States. And so I think once there's funding put behind it or more journalists start exploring it, that we will find that we have the same tragedy of missing and murdered Native women here in the United States and probably a lot of the same dynamics at play as well. So that's a, a project that needs to be um, looked at. It became, I think it at some point became too difficult for me to do that research. So I've shared it with others, hoping that somebody else will pick it up and run with it, but um, it's very painful. So I'd like to conclude our event and thank Professor Deere for her time, her mind, and her spirit, as well as her audience for all their outstanding thank questions. You. Please feel free to stay. There's food and drink. Um, um, and speak with Professor Deere as you like. Otherwise, uh, thank you for being here. This concludes thank our you. event. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent job. <laughs>